Awesome service so far, huh? Right? Worship was great. We had a great slice of life. Awesome drama this morning. So welcome to Cornerstone. So, so excited to have you guys here with us this morning. Uh, let me get my technology working. And then, uh, oh, Jeff, this one's for you, by the way. I thought about this. Uh, so Jay's, they got to line up right here. V's in the back. Chris and Craig up front. I thought of that one for a long time. Was, yeah. All right, let's start with a word of prayer here and just uh, thank God for, for his deliverance in our lives. Father God, uh, we thank you so much just for this morning. God, things you're doing, uh, how you're working in us, God, uh, how you're present with us, Father. So we just invite you into our hearts, God. Um, open them, God, to hear your word, um, just to understand what you are bringing forth, God, and to accept that message, God. Uh, and then to do whatever you put on our hearts, God. We thank you for this church family and all that we are, God, in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So to today's title, as you can see, is God is our deliverer. So I want to ask you a question. What sorts of images come to mind when you think about the topic of deliverance or delivery? Now, I, I work in, uh, in floor covering, and one of the things that comes to my mind right away is transportation because we ship a lot of products. So I think of FedEx and, uh, and UPS and things of that sort. There's other kinds of delivery, though, too, naturally as well, too. Uh, maybe there's delivery like delivering on a, on a winning hit in a baseball game, kind of like the Oakland A's have done just about every time they've won this season. They are, uh, they're definitely on a roll and got a flair for dramatic, so sorry, Giants fans. I apologize. <laughs> they do have the best record in the majors. Uh, maybe, maybe there's another type of deliverance, and there's a deliverance on a promise. Maybe you promised your daughter uh, that you'd go to her, uh, her, her dance recital. Uh, maybe, wives, you promised your husband, hey, do you know that check engine oil light? I promise I'm going to get that thing fixed. And the problem can be in those situations, if you fail to deliver on that promise, it can be quite damaging. So it's important, it's critical that we deliver through on those things that, we're, that, that we promise in that state. But, but really, that's not the deliverance I'm getting at this morning. I really want to talk about a more important deliverance, and that's deliverance in a supernatural sense. Okay? And by a show of hands, how many of you here believe that there are such things as supernatural things? You can raise your hands and let me know if you believe that. Okay, because any of you who affirm the resurrection would raise your hand in, in, in truth because that is certainly not a natural event. And, and really by show of, of your hands, you've affirmed one thing. You, you told me how you believed or how you think God could or would act in any situation in your life. So this morning, that's what we're going to kind of dive into. Um, I've, I've described here before a time 10 years ago in my life for you just in a just kind of brief uh, sense of where I was generally, but I never really gave you one event that transformed my life uh, and gave me this strong sense of what deliverance truly is. So I want to share that with you this morning. Um, I take it to a place that cemented deliverance in Chris Ferraro's mind, and hopefully it helps kind of do the same thing for you here this morning. So it was a typical night. Um, I had been struggling for four months with anxiety and depression, uh, brought on by some things that I was doing, some personal decisions I made um, to, uh, to party a little too hard and things of that sort. So as I cleansed myself of all that stuff, I found myself in a position of struggling just deeply. I had tremors at night, I, night sweats, I couldn't fall asleep. And this was a nightly thing. I, 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 was, I was constantly surrounded by images of death and despair in my heart and in my, and in my mind, and I just couldn't get rid of them. Really, truly, the only time I felt like there was peace is when I fell asleep. But as you can tell, there was a lack of that. That was a, that was a rare commodity at the time. Sleep was kind of one of those things I, I wish would happen. And by sheer exhaustion, I would just fall asleep at 4 o'clock and maybe get two or three hours of rest at the most. This went on for four months, and, and you know, during the time, and I know you probably have all experienced the same thing, if, you're ex if you've gone through some tough times, you think to yourself, where is God in this time? Does he even know I'm suffering, or does he care that I'm suffering? Is it the problem, you know? Uh, is God disinterested? Is he, is he just distant? Does he not care? Because I tell you, I felt like Satan was attacking me at every chance he got. He was constantly swarming things around me. And I'm like, God, I just need your help. I need you to deliver me. And I felt like there wasn't anything coming. Yeah, I used to sleep with my Bible next to me, um, cuddling it, thinking to myself that somehow those words that had gone silent for so long would actually speak to me. Something would happen as I grasped it and I just held it close to me. I know Pastor Craig described that, that he used to do the same thing um, through his, some of his tough struggles he's recently had. And so as I sat up just frustrated, I used to walk around the room, and it was 2.30 in the morning, and I, and I sat back down in bed, and I and just leaned my head up against the, um, the wall that was behind me. And I remember thinking to myself, this is never going to end. Nothing is going to come to a close. And as I set my head back, I closed my eyes, 
And it was like this billboard um, had shown. And the word Psalm 40 just flashed <laughs> like a billboard in my mind. And I opened my eyes. And we probably, if we've experienced anything sort of, you know, how God's moved in our hearts. Have you ever experienced that? Think to yourself just for a second. Man, am I tired? Like maybe, you know, I didn't get enough sleep. It's, maybe my mind's playing tricks on me. And I broke away from that doubt. And I thought to myself, okay, Chris, what do you got to lose? What's the worst thing that can happen if you pick up the Bible and read Psalm 40? Maybe it doesn't say what you think it was going to say. So I picked up the Bible after I kind of broke, broke through this. Um, and here's what I read in Psalm 40, the first line I read. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me. And he heard my cry. Um, uh, <clears throat> like that, like that, uh, like that night, uh, I immediately broke down. Uh, I cried. Uh, I had realized that I wasn't alone. God and he was listening and he never he never stopped listening and he was there and he waited with me and he was patient with me he heard my screams and my cries when I continued to read he drew me up out of a pit of destruction, which it felt like to me at the time. Out of this miry bog, he set my feet on a rock, making, making secure my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to him. Many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. For you have multiplied, O oh my Lord, O oh my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us, and none can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them. For none can compare. You have given an ear to me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told of your great news in the congregation, and behold, I have not restrained my lips. I have not concealed your steadfast love. And I continue to read, and this part really struck me, was that for your evils, for evils have encompassed beyond number. My heart fails me. But here's where I used to cry every night. But be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. And I swear, I used to think to myself, David, David must have written that with me in mind 2,500 years ago. And God knew what Chris was going to struggle with too. And he put that in that place just for me. Then may all who seek you be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. And as for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought of me. You are my help and my deliverer. I used to scream this, do not delay, oh my God. You know, as the tears just continued to pour down my cheek, I was overcome with this sense of deliverance, divine power that had come upon me. And I wasn't left any longer in my place. He wasn't silent. He wasn't removed. He was my rescuer. He was my deliverer. And the fact that I made it through those four months before that were all on God's shoulders. It didn't end there. I'll be honest. I would love to say that that was the final night in my road to recovery, but it wasn't. But for six more months after that, I was comforted by a psalm that leapt out in my mind in the middle of the night by a God who wasn't silent and a God who cared. So this transformed my experience. And you might not have had such an elaborate experience as I had had, but I can promise you, you've all seen the awesome power of God in your lives. So I want to take you through this morning, David's Psalm. And we're just going to find a couple key verses so we can apply some practical lessons out of what I kind of experienced that morning. And that'll help us really in these struggles against the physical and the spiritual world, which are both active in our lives. And they're both pulling us in different directions. Let's look at verse 1 first, uh, which is a, a powerful reminder um, for us to remember. And it said this, it says this, I waited patiently for the Lord, patiently for the Lord. And he inclined, and this word inclined literally means that God just, I mean, he just reached 
out as far as he could for you. I remember swimming with my daughter on, uh, on Saturday at, a, at, a, at, a, at her aunt's house, and I was reaching out. And I'm like, just jump to daddy. You can do it. Just jump to daddy. And I started thinking, that's kind of how God was like, just, just jump to me. Come to me, Chris. I'm here. I'm, I'm, you're safe. You're safe with me. So he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. So the question is, what are you going through right now? Right now that you feel much like I do, that you, you need God to stretch out, reach out, reach out his arms for you. You struggling at work? Tough job situation with the boss? Is your marriage taking a turn that maybe you didn't really expect it to and now you find yourself in a tough spot there too? Maybe you've been looking for Mr. or Mrs. Right for a very long time. You just can't find him or her. And you're struggling and you're frustrated with that situation. Maybe you feel overwhelmed with the task of parenting. Uh, we just mentioned earlier our parenting class that's coming up uh, on August 13th on Wednesday night here at 6.30 at Cornerstone. So I uh, would encourage you to, number one, look, look at your emails. Craig had sent out some invitation emails. If you didn't get one of those, please get a hold of Pastor Craig or Brenda after service and ask them if you can be a part of that. It will certainly help you through the woes of parenting. There are, there are great joys in parenting, but there are certainly woes too. And I think as you join in a small group, you'll get that opportunity to really just fellowship with one another and help work through these problems together. So just like David, it would be wise for us to learn to wait patiently. And I want to, this is a frustrating part, and I know Jeff talked about waiting a little bit ago, and I just want to bring this up to you. The word waiting here means to wait on waiting. And that's kind of crazy. You're thinking, I have to wait on the process of waiting. And it just teaches you to constantly re-engage in that process of waiting. But it can be a very difficult thing, especially when you're trying to endure something that's so overwhelming and so tough in your hearts and so tough in your lives. So, I want to suggest this first thing, and this is a key one too to just start off in this process. There's lots of folks around that can help you with this. Is that you want to enlist the help of wise Christians, Christians who have experienced similar things that you've experienced in your heart, but they've overcome those things. So I would suggest open up to that opportunity. And these are the type of people that you know who I'm talking about. They're the ones that will bear with you. They'll listen to you cry. They'll listen to you talk and yell and get angry and frustrated, and they'll stay with you the whole time, walking you through this process. Now, pastors are an outstanding resource for this, but let me suggest, number one, that might be a little difficult if everybody went to Pastor Craig for help. But second, uh, there's people all around you. If you look around at the folks sitting next to you this morning and behind you, and the folks you'll see out in the lobby, these are the people that you can come to, that you can trust. I know um, Kathy Lindstrom has been a great source uh, and a resource for my wife in the same process, so I would suggest there are folks just like that sitting around you that can help you. Uh, and they would bear with you through this frustration and trial that you're going through. Secondly, I know you might not feel like it. I can tell you I didn't in the very beginning. Um, I came to this point after a few weeks of just terrible things that were going on with me. I want to ask you to commit to yourselves to spend daily, daily time in the Word of God, particularly recalling verses that talk about deliverance, verses that talk about uh, petitionary prayer and answers to prayer and patience in that process, uh, salvation and so on. These verses can be a great resource for you to recall on and call on when you are going through these tough parts because it can be a very hard thing to see beyond the struggles that you're in at that time. You would realize that God is there, He's real and He's active and He hadn't left your side. Now if you're unclear on where to find that, let me suggest a couple of things. First, in the back of your Bible, there are tons of words that are available. It's kind of a mini concordance that's back there. You can use that to do topical searches or word searches. Second, if you don't have that in the back of your Bible, and some Bibles don't, you can simply go to a Christian bookstore or an Amazon.com and purchase a concordance which lists every word that's mentioned in Scripture and the times it's mentioned and the verses that it's mentioned in. And then you can also link that back to the Hebrew and Greek original words so you can get a little idea of what that word actually meant back in the context of the time. And that helps you gra grab some of that too. Do Google search if you feel like it. Use podcasts or BibleGateway.com, uh, which has a great word search tool on there too, just to really dive into it. But it's important that this, it can be hard to stay in that place of devotion. So I want to ask you to step back to step number one and enlist that same wise counselor, the same person that you're asking to help you to be your accountability partner in this step two, in this process. Now I know if you've struggled before, you've come to a place where I am too, that hindsight's 2020. Ah, God absolutely delivered right on time. But when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't feel like God delivered right on time. It feels like he's never coming sometimes. And that can be a hard place to be. So by a show of hands, I want to give you a little helper here, but by a show of hands, how many of you use a journal or something to record your thoughts and your prayers? By a show of hands, how many use something like that? Okay. This is not only good secular advice on a, just a normal world stand, but it's also great spiritual advice. And let me, let me take you back to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis, and explain to you how we got this example for us to use in our own Christian walk. Folks like Jacob 
had these great, powerful interactions with God, and they did something to remember that by. They, they built things called altars in order to remember what God did. And let me just share with you what that looks like. This is one of the passages from Genesis here. It said, So Jacob said to his household, Let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make an altar there to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I've gone. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, and there he built an altar and called that place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. This altar, this altar was this constant reminder for these guys that how God had come down and interacted in their lives in a miraculous and journal of life events for them, basically. So I would invite you to do the same thing. Journal life events, journal answers to prayers, thoughts that you're having and things of this sort so that you can write them down and these will help you walk through situations as they come apart about in your life later on. Okay? I use an app called Prayer Notes. Uh, it's available on the App Store. You can download that. But a simple written journal works just fine. If you like to type, you can use a anywhere processor application. That'll, that'll totally do it. It's important to keep this running account, though, of how God has moved in your life. So when you go through these tough times and these struggles, you can recall these things and renew your faith and hope that God is not distant and that he's going to come and do something big. So the purpose of our lives is important. I think that we always recall this. The purpose of our lives is not that we avoid trials and tribulations and struggles. It's actually quite the contrary. Our lives are guaranteed a level of suffering, and that can be a hard thing to hear. You know, we're here on Sunday mornings, and it's about praising and feeling good, but sometimes we're amidst a lot of struggling stuff that, that keeps us distant from that ability to really reach out and experience God in a unique way. And uh, I wanted to show you where we're, we're called to suffer and where there's an example of that in Scripture. Pastor Craig mentioned this last week, actually, in the book of First Peter, and I want to take you to that place today just to remind you of this. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. And why are we supposed to do that? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that, and this is so important, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. God hasn't left you alone, and your brothers and sisters are experiencing the same thing around the world. Then after you've suffered a little while, and that's a promise, guys, we're going to suffer a little while. This is such a beautiful blessing. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore you, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And, you know, our lives are going to be littered with suffering. And we can take heart as this passage finishes that this great promise tells us that after we've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace will rescue us. The God of all grace will restore us. The God of all grace will give us the revitalization that we need to continue in our pursuit of the upward calling in Christ Jesus. All right, so, we're assuming you took the step of personally recording all of these tips and, and experiences and things that you've come through in deliverance and seeing God act. That's it, right? I and mean, we're done. We, we can put away the book. I mean, I've, I've done everything I could. All right, we're finished in that process. Of course not, we're not finished in that process. This is one of the most crucial steps, and this is the next step I want to invite you to do. It's just the beginning step, and verses 9 and 10 tell us a little bit about it. Here's verses 9 and 10 again from Psalm 40. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O Lord, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. David was emphatic in his point that he hadn't kept silent in what he had experienced and the deliverance that God had brought for him. David proclaimed this to the people, and it brought hope. And it also gave knowledge that there's an awesome power that God is working in other people's lives. So our next step then is that we need to share the deliverance that God has brought with us, with other people. All the details you can recall, how it happened, how you felt during the experience. And I know, you know what, we've got a, a society that's about themselves a lot and you seem like people are disinterested in what's going on in your life and you might feel like that but let me promise you when you begin to share your story people take note and they listen and they hear what you have to say 
If we share like this, if we do what David did, we help rekindle hope in others. You never know. You just never know when your experiences will be used, how they'll be used, and when, and, and, and who the person is that they're going to come into impact. But I can promise you this. God will use those experiences. He won't leave those to waste. He'll make it true. I recall a time I remember um, my aunt was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I remember that uh, she really struggled. She came into a point of grief and, and depression she had never really experienced before. And she was really unsure of where she was going to be going. She thought it was a death sentence, quite frankly. Um, and I remember she said, I'm going to go to a support group and I'm going to just go and talk with people and I'm going to listen to their stories. And as she did, she realized that her struggle wasn't any different than anybody else was experiencing. And it helped her begin to learn to cope with what was going on. And she was able to kind of come through that. And that's the process that I'm talking about this morning. As you begin to share your experiences with other, other people, you can see that it's going to begin to help them. It provides them the strength to carry on. Something that will help them sustain that tough spot in their life. Maybe there's somebody that you've experienced that has done the same thing for you. Maybe, you've, maybe you can name that person now in your heart. And if it is, say thank you to God for who they are. We have a group at Cornerstone that really shares in that same sort of message. Um, this approach to health and healing that we have is part of our Cornerstone Recovery Group that meets um, regularly here at Cornerstone. They study scripture. They engage in life um, and really in providing an environment of love, comfort, safety, um, to communicate their issues of sobriety and their issues with, uh, their issues with addiction. Uh, if you need more information about this group, you think maybe you have somebody that, that would benefit from the group or, or you think that you yourself could benefit from this type of counsel and this type of love and study. You can see Kurt and Terry Meads. Kurt and Terry Meads, you guys want to raise your hand real quick. They're over here, guys. See them after service if you feel like that. Uh, that is something for you. It's an awesome ministry that they do, and they're such a blessing to our community. So it's here for you. All right, let's recap a little bit. Let's go back and see what we, what we just talked about here. Um, these are the practical ways God can deliver us, right? And we can work with these ways through deliverance. First, find those few close, wise Christian friends, or those ones that you can really trust in. Begin to speak with them and begin to have them pray over you through your trial. In depression, you can isolate yourself. It's very easy to pull inward and focus on just who you are and internalize everything. But they will encourage you to get out and begin to see the world around you is still alive, still functioning, and still active. And you can be a part of that world. You don't have to pull everything inside. So it's, it's helpful to have somebody helping you along in that process. Second point, again, is I ask you to commit to this, making the, making the study of the word um, an integral part and a daily part of your life. The, the writer of the book of Hebrews reminds us of this great fact, and I love, I love this verse. It's so powerful. First part starts like this. The, the word of God is living and active. And we believe that. It's living and active. It's moving. It's not just stale. Their words leap out of this page and change our lives. The word of God is, is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and I love this part, and discerning, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. So if you spend daily time with God, he will revitalize your soul. A soul that probably in the time of struggling and going through those tough, sticky life situations is in a need of refreshment. Third, if you don't already have one, get yourself a journal or begin to journal all of your life events. Write down the things that the amazing way God stepped in and did amazing feats of supernatural strength in your life. Then you can help recall these things as you're going through your struggles. And lastly, don't sit quietly. Please don't sit quietly with what you've experienced. Cool. Make sure you don't fall in the trap of thinking that nobody cares. It's not important to them. It is important. Share that. Matter of fact, um, we used to have a group here that stood right where I am on the, on, uh, up here and shared their testimonies with other folks in our community. It was from Phil Berkowitz put it together. Uh, and this sort of thing is a reminder to us that this is happening around the world. God is moving and active. So I would ask you to share those things in your workplace. You share those things in the community and where you're at, at Starbucks or wherever it might be. Small group, please share those things in your small group so they can pray with you and be encouraged by that experience. And here too, on Sunday mornings before and after service, just reach out and take some time to really reach people's lives like that. If you're interested in doing similarly like what Amanda did, and we've had other folks come through here on a slice of cornerstones, please see Pastor Craig or myself after service and say, you know what, I've got a story I want to share with everybody, um, and I'd like to do it on a Sunday morning. And you know, we'd love to get you part of the, the series and, and, get you, and get you plugged in in the schedule. So I'll leave you with, with these last couple thoughts and a question to begin with. 
So God is the God who saves. Do you agree with that? Yes? Amen? You guys can say it, yes? Do you agree with that? Okay. So he was so concerned with our lives that he sent Jesus, his son, to deal with the punishment that should have been put on all shoulders, right? Christ took the brunt of God's righteous wrath. And because of that, we don't have to live in defeat anymore. And we can live with a sense of great deliverance. We could live with a sense of victory over all the circumstances in our lives. You're never alone in your battles. You're never unloved. God will never leave your side. He's never going to abandon you. And importantly, you're never powerless against those things because God has given you strength through the Holy Spirit to withstand. God wants to give you this life that you've always dreamed of, this life of peace and joy, a joy and peace that cannot be extinguished by the storms of life. It won't be put out because our God cares. Do you believe that, church? You affirm that truth? If you do believe that God is active, if you do believe that he can do great things in your life, then would you just stand with me right now? Stand with me. Affirm that truth. Affirm that truth that God saves, that God's real, that God is active and powerful, that he's concerned with each and every one of your lives as he is with mine. Thank you for standing. And, and I invite you to stay in that posture as we take some time to pray and to thank God for his deliverance. And then after we do that, I just want to invite you to join us as a community in clapping, singing, and in worshiping our Heavenly Father as we do this all together as a community that affirms this truth, that God, our King, delivers our very soul. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, for um, the way you never leave us, God the way you never forsake us, and the way just in time, God, always on your time, you deliver us, God. Father, your truths ring so true to our hearts, God, and they speak to us, Father. Would our hearts be open to hearing you? Would you help us this week to recall how you changed us, God? Would you help us this week to record those things, God, to write them down, to pray over them, to be thankful for how you move? God, let our worship show you how thankful we are. And let our lives beam forth with a light, God, that gives hope to those who are experiencing darkness, God, just as you gave hope to us in our dark times. You are not distant, God, but you are here with us. Every hour of the day, every moment that we're awake, you stand by our side, King. So we give our praise over to you. We give everything we have to your loving grace. It is in your son's holy, precious name that we pray. Amen.